going to go back to kind of the beginning. I know you had worked with the Kings before, Michelle and Robert King, um, executive mm -hmm. producers on um, The Good Wife and The Good Fight. Did they come to you? Did they say, we have this guy we want you to play? How did you get involved? I had just gotten free from the series Luke Cage. And um, for me, I think it was like a relief because I kind of was ready to move on to do something else. Mm -hmm. And I was appreciative of the opportunity, but I was looking for something else to do. And so I was fortunate enough that I had had a meeting with CBS, the brass, a few months earlier, and they were talking in generalities about projects. Mm -hmm. And and so I did these around, around the town meetings to just see what lay of the land would be, what is out there, what might be right for me with all these networks and studios. And they mentioned sort of, you know, as a side note, that, um, that the Kings were doing something uh, mm -hmm. in a limited form uh, series style, maybe 13 episodes, not a full season of 22. And I was like, wow, that's, you know, I'm looking for something definitely less than 22 episodes. I'm looking for something that um, is character driven, uh, well written, um, and just different. Um, I wasn't necessarily looking for network or cable, just good writing. About a month and a half went by and I was working on something in New Orleans and my people called me and said, hey, the Kings have finally, they got a script together and they want to um, send it to you. I had kind of passed on a few other projects mm -hmm. and I was really just happy that I, I waited until I found something that I wanted to do. Your character David is a priest in training who has paired with Katja Herber's Kristen who is a forensic psychologist I believe. She's trying to look for a scientific reason for possession and mm -hmm. you are trying to look for a non-scientific uh, reason. The problem with my job is that possession looks a lot like insanity and I need someone to help me distinguish between the two. A double lead procedural on a network show, like getting really good chemistry is such a crapshoot, right? I mean, like mm -hmm. everything can look great on paper and then it just cuts together. And it yeah. But you guys, you guys have it. So I'm wondering, like, is that something you feel like the first when you're doing when you were doing your first scenes with her? Was that is it is it a palpable thing? Is it something you have to work at? Are you about to impress me? <laughs> I'll try. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, that is something you can't plan, and there was no effort put into it. The Kings cast someone who they had never met, I had never met, we had never met, and I've been in situations where you have chemistry reads. We didn't do that. Um, chemistry reads can be very awkward. I've been in chemistry reads years and years ago where things that were going on in those rooms and you go, is this even legal? Like, what are we doing here? Like, or is this like, am I, what am I, do what am I doing? I've never met her. Hello. How are you? Or what are we, are we holding hands? Are we hugging? Like, like, it's just, I find it to be unnecessary to be quite honest. We're actors. We'll figure it out. Um, and, and honestly, when me and Katya first met, it wasn't a read. We just sort of, um, we were having a meeting. Um, I was talking to the Kings. She came in. She was jet lagged. She she came in, and I think I was either running over time or she forgot her time. And we ended up sitting down talking to them together. And uh -huh. that's the first time I met her. And I think right away we um, had a, a very shorthand um, um, back and forth because I think we like to get in, on each other's nerves a little bit. We like to poke fun at things. We don't take ourselves too seriously at all. Um, we sort of have the same views in a lot of ways in life. So there's a genuine. Um, friendship there that kind of was quick and i think actors have to develop that because you have to work with these people so um so yeah it's been she's been the best uh best person to to, to work with since I, I, can, I can imagine you know that's awesome the show covers a lot of freaky stuff and is there anything any of the episodes that kind of tapped into oh i've been afraid of that my whole life or oh that's something that always like makes me a little uneasy i look at a few episodes and i think to myself am i afraid of being in a cornfield in the middle of the night i grew up in the south and i grew up around <laughs> woods and 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 i grew up you know in places where you know deer would run across the yard um you'd see critters you'd see things i never walked in the woods um what i and we had we had a farm not a farm but we had we had crops we had we had a garden I, the idea that you know that i would walk into a cornfield that were that were stalks taller than myself and just walking no i mean i, I watched children of the corn growing up <laughs> it, it would never cross my mind to even go into the cornfield um at night you brought up the cornfield and so i would like to know did you actually see that heinous evil demon baby like was that an actual prop i'm pretty sure i saw it minus this the embryonic sac or something like that <laughs> i don't think I, it didn't have a sack on it um and it, when I saw it, I mean, it was just like, you know, it looked like, it looked like, you know, something like the baby alien, you know, from, from the, back in the, you know, it's just, yes. it, it looked awful. And obviously, um, obviously it was unexplained. Um, that, that, that scene uh, to, to me, what, what I found, Katya was able to 
find somehow bring levity to it because her reaction to it, I mean, it, it's literally like it's the most grotesque thing you've ever seen, and she still tries to make make it work. One thing I love about the show is those batshit moments. You have this like this like very well-crafted drama and then all of a sudden episode 12 there is a goat demon therapist in the uh, in the room with leland and he's taking notes on a legal pad so i mean yeah. things like that when you see them in the script are do they surprise you anymore are you kind of used to the the like yeah yeah no I, I think i think it always surprises me um and that's good because you know i think there's a certain there's a certain way they go about doing things like i think they like again so demon baby unexplained i think there was a scene we shot that kind of did explain it like sort of in a way but then they just edited it out because they, they thought it be, it was best left unexplained mm -hmm. with the goat demon are we gonna see this thing again is that real am i dreaming is leland dreaming like you don't even know that's the thing about it you don't even know what's going on you don't know if it's a dream you don't know who's dreaming you don't know if it's real you don't know if it's gonna ever be seen again you don't know if they'll explain it again you don't know you don't know you just don't know yeah. and i think that's what's great about it to go from something very silly to something much more serious episode 11 was a huge episode for you the room 320 episode and definitely spoke to a lot of the things that have come up in the world in the past few weeks you know systemic racism oh, yeah. and how how that how that manifests in the medical system and how that is to the detriment of black patients especially black men right and how they're supposed to be able yeah. to take so much more and all that um you read that you get that script you read that script i'm wondering for you on a personal level did did it hit you in a different way it was such a defining episode i think people either really loved it or could hate it probably i mean this depends because it wasn't like any other episode it didn't necessarily tie in so much so easily so you could have come into that episode never seen any, any part of the show and 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 not quite understand the show but but absolutely have um have an understanding and an adventure all in that one episode and, mm -hmm. and then the next episode not even see what how that happened um i was like reading that episode and i was just like going wow um i knew see i'd never been in a hospital before um, mm -hmm. thank, thankfully, um, my, I've had family in hospitals. I've had my mom, uh, my father, um, in hospitals when you're helpless and you're at the mercy of someone else. I've had stories, family members who had older people who just were, were, were taken advantage of, um, by, by caretakers. You see it on camera. You hear about these stories. I mean, when you're, when you're in a room with someone who's got anything they can think of within reach, the drugs it's amazing how much they can get away with i talked to some people who during this pandemic you think about the medical field how many people are qualified to administer medication how many people are qualified to take care of people and when you run when you run into your second or third line of defense and people are getting sick and you have another person and you're working these long hours and you're working these long shifts and and the person is just tired or the person just doesn't know and the person and they don't they're asking for help but there's no one on staff who actually can help them yeah. so they're guessing and I mean, I, I give my kids medication. I read the back, back of the bottle three times just to make sure I'm not giving them too right, much. Right, you know, right. Can you imagine if you got dopamine, blah, 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 you got like seven or eight medications and you just don't know really what you're doing, but, you're, but your job is to give that medication. So there are people who do it intentionally. There are people who don't know what they're doing. There are mm -hmm. people who um, give you too much because they have, um, they have a, a, a subconscious or a not so subconscious, not, not so subconscious opinion of how medication works for you. Um, whether they believe how much pain you're in, it's right. it's a, it, it runs the gamut. So it, it, it left so many questions for people. I think they were like, "Is this person evil? It, it, does she do this intentionally? Is he dreaming?" Um, and right. at the end, you see those you see those things in the, in the locker room in the locker, and it's just disturbing because I've read stories people do that. They, they work. It's like a cop. I mean, not to tie it in, but cops, nurses. You can go from one hospital and go to another hospital. You can go to you can go to another a police department. Yeah. You could you're you can be completely unqualified and mess something up and find a job somewhere else sometimes. And it is insanely frightening. It's because of nurses like Plague. They torture and kill us. We saw him in the second half of the season start to really self-doubt, really second-guess himself. There was a lot of guilt after being with uh, Renee coming around. There's a lot of thinking about Julia and all that. Um, Talk to me about, I don't know if you've had any conversations about season two and where he's going. I mean, is he is he still pretty secure in the fact in the idea that he wants to to serve the church in this way? Like he wants to be a priest? They've broken down season two. We had a discussion about it. It starts really right where we left off. When you're with David's age and you're trying to find some sort of direction in your life, these sort of things happen 
and you have to stick to your beliefs, but you can never be 100% certain. I don't think anyone will ever say that who is, you know, because you, you, you meet people who talk about it. Again, you know, you're talking to someone who doesn't answer back, and if they are answering back, something's probably wrong. But you remember, there are people who think that they think they hear God speaks to them. And, you know, do, do they actually hear a voice? Um, how, they, how they're interpreting this? Um, what is God saying to them? So it gets really tricky. And, and so all in the name of God, when I think about David, I feel like his journey, no matter how much he says it's, it's, uh, com- he's committed, there has to be some doubt deep, deep, deep down inside. Mm-hmm. There can't, I, I, don't, I don't know as in human nature, do you talk about it? No. Um, but I think, I think the more you doubt, the more conviction you have, the more you lean into it, the more you embrace it, the more you try to convince everyone, yourself, the more you commit to the doctrine, because you have to. It's like, because they say it's all faith. I mean, that's what it's, it's built on. It's built on faith. So that's what I, I think David is, is really struggling with, struggling with listening to the science of it all, which he is respects, and then understanding his position and sometimes seeing that the position that he holds is wrong. I mean, let's be honest. He invited someone who's a scientist who doesn't believe at all. And then this other person who sort of doesn't believe at all. He's the only believer really. Right. And sometimes somehow maybe that's going to shift, but at this point he's got to hold, he's got to hold on to his beliefs as tight as he can, because he, I don't know what he would be without that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It also seems to me that like, you have to have this undying conviction. You have to live by a series of rules that maybe are not super easy to live by. I mean, like with Renee's character, you know, who play, you know, she plays Renee and it's like, well, if that happened, was that gonna, is that, what does that do? I mean, okay, he confessed and moved on. Right. Is he gonna do that again? Right. How does he feel about, you know, uh, Kristen, you know, her character? What's going on with that? It's, you know, what what is going on with him? Like, you know what I mean? Like he just, you know, he just, he just had sex. Okay. We, you know, you just had sex and you just gonna act like it didn't happen. Like what's going on now? And you know, are you gonna have sex again? Right. I, I mean, think about it. It's like a, it's like an alcoholic or something like that. If you, you drank, you got drunk one night. All right. I'm pretty sure you're gonna drink again. Right. You, right. you know what I mean? Right. Yeah. If you're in an AA meeting, now you have to go back and call and start all over again. You know? Right. It's like, what did you, what did you just do? Right, right. I mean, I was not going to bring up David and Kristen together just because I want that so badly that I feel like it like infuses all of my like reading of this show, you know, but, but at the same time, there is some, there's a connection there. Yes. I mean, we saw that in the episode where they went out to meet his, his father. You know, everything about that road trip was sort of like, okay. Um, I think once they got away and they're just sort of like by themselves, I felt like, you know, I felt like they weren't as professional as they normally are or as, as, um, you know, respectful of the boundaries. I mean, and it wasn't um, spoken about. It's just that, you know, you, they were on Cytosillin or whatever and sort of loosened them up a little bit. And then mm-hmm. they sort of went with it. And, you know, that hippie feel, everybody's free feeling and free loving out there and having a good time. And, you know, it just, it just sort of got in there, sort of started to rub off on them, I think. And then they came home and they sort of like, you know, and then the husband showed up and then I just sort of like, okay, back to reality. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was a fun episode. Um, definitely definitely made you made you see them how they possibly could be up there were like you know when the kids aren't there when the church is involved and when, when ben isn't there like who are these two people if they're just hanging out and so that sort of gave you a glimpse of that so we get to the finale and we have this double whammy where like david has his first vision you know any kind of you know chemical interference right mm-hmm. but it's easy it's it's her in the field and and demon therapist whatever is coming for her. and um mm-hmm. And at the same time, we see, you know, David earlier in the episode says, oh, yeah, like if a crucifix burns you, that's a real sure sign of possession. And that happens. To yeah. Them. So I know you obviously can't tell me exactly what's going to happen, but do you think that their relationship is at a point where she would tell him this? Do you think she's going to be someone who's like going to keep this very close to the best until she figures out what's going on? I mean, if she did tell him. I don't know that that you know he's not going to try to fast forward a, a an exorcism. I mean, who you, you've seen how the exorcisms work? I don't think anybody wants to be in the, be exorcised. I think, right. I think I think I think she would probably you know it's like it's like the COVID test. I mean, you know they're running two tips up your nose, up like you know halfway up to your brain. Wow. Like I mean, it, if if you're asking me if I have no symptoms, I'm not going to go volunteer for that. And, and if I cough, I'm not going to. I'm going to take it's going to take a little more for me to like you know have you stick that thing up to my my brain. Um, so I feel like I feel like she. It's a secret. I don't. I don't think she's going to talk about it. I could be wrong, you know. But it's definitely something that's to be to be discussed. I mean, this we have to figure out what happened there, you know. Yeah. Like, I also love that you compared the COVID test to exorcism. That is like, I mean, I don't know a better way to wrap this conversation <laughs> up than that. So thank you for that gift. 